If you calorie restrict, your thyroid will suffer, your basal metabolic rate will suffer, and you will put yourself into a vicious cycle. I call it calorie restricted prison. It doesn't work long term. You must focus on food quality. And if you do that, you will be more satiated and lose weight easily. On this week's podcast, I talk about my day of eating. In fact, I talk about two days of eating, and I go through these in detail with Chronometer. This is a program online where you can put in the things that you eat, and you can see the micronutrients. You can see your macronutrients, the carbohydrates, protein, and fat. You can see the breakdown of omega-6 fatty acids. How much linoleic acid am I eating every day? Find out in this podcast. You can see how much protein I'm getting, how many carbs, how much fat, which fats, like I said. You can see the nutrients that I'm getting, the minerals, the vitamins, what I might be deficient in, what I'm getting a lot of, et cetera. So I break all of that down I show you how I eat an animal-based diet. I've done that multiple times. I've done a video on YouTube with what I eat in a day, but this is a chronometer breakdown of the micronutrients in my diet and how I'm eating every day, day in and day out. I hope it's helpful for you guys. What you'll see is that it's a pretty nutrient replete diet. There's really nothing that I'm deficient in eating this way. And I think that the overages are all things that are good for humans and will lead to vitality and health. So. Enjoy this podcast with my breakdown of my diet on Chronometer. It's detailed, but I think it will help many of you uh, get a sense of what this powerful way of eating, an animal-based diet of organs, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy can do for humans, for you, for your family, to create health, to regain health, and to perpetuate the health that you already have. These are the foods that humans have been seeking for hundreds of thousands of years throughout our existence. And I feel like they're the least toxic because they don't have things like vegetables, which have more plant defense chemicals in them. And as you can see, like I said, there really are no nutrient deficiencies in this way of eating. So enjoy this podcast. I wanted to do a full podcast on what I eat in a day. But to make it interesting for you guys, I'm going to also use chronometer throughout this podcast. I have two days of full eating for me that are put into chronometer. And I'm gonna break down all of my macros. So protein, fat, carbohydrates. I'm gonna tell you guys how many calories I eat in a day. I have my activity in there. And then we're gonna go through micronutrients and look for any micronutrient deficiencies or nutrient deficiencies in my animal-based diet. Most of you know that I define a quote-unquote animal-based diet as something like a carnivore diet but with the addition of some least toxic sources of carbohydrates, specifically things like fruit and honey. In the last six to eight months, I've also added raw dairy to my animal-based diet and found that it does not trigger my eczema. Many of you know my full story, but in brief, I had bad eczema on my elbows, on my wrists, on my knees in medical school, which prevented me from doing things like jujitsu many times. And then it got really bad in residency and I did strict carnivore. That was kind of the beginning of my own journey. It improved the eczema, but long-term with that, I ran into electrolyte issues in ketosis. So I added fruit back to my diet as the least toxic source of carbohydrates, in my opinion. I've done previous podcasts where I've shown my continuous glucose monitor readings with carbohydrates in my diet because I eat a robust amount of carbohydrates. If you have questions about those, please refer back to the previous podcast on continuous glucose monitors. I use one from NutriSense. You can find them at NutriSense.io. And I also have spoken in the past about my blood work multiple times. I did a podcast on my July 2022 blood work and in my August 2022 blood work. And so you can find both of those on all the platforms. And you can see that I remain very insulin sensitive, both with my continuous glucose monitor readings and my fasting insulin, which is consistently below three micro IU per ml. So the addition of carbohydrates did not give me diabetes or create any degree of insulin resistance. That is a fallacy um, clearly shown multiple times over in the medical literature. So let's get into what I eat in a day and we'll go through all the macros and break it down for you guys so you can hopefully mirror this in your own life or some of this will be helpful for you in creating your own animal-based diet. I will say from the outset that if you're curious about what macros, carbohydrates, protein, and fat might work for you based on your body type, whether you want to gain weight or lose weight, your activity level, we put a free calculator 
for an animal-based diet at carnivoremd.com. There's a new website, carnivoremd.com. And there's a free calculator there for how to make an animal-based diet and your macros. And there's tons of resources there about how to construct an animal-based diet. So again, an animal-based diet is organs and meat, the foods that I believe are the most sought after by humans throughout our existence. The Hadza clearly favor these foods in their diet and are always wanting to hunt. And then with the addition of the least toxic sources of carbohydrates, fruit and honey and raw dairy as a recent addition. Raw dairy is a very recent addition to the human diet, but I think that there's plenty of good evidence that it's very beneficial for most people, especially different than pasteurized dairy. I'll talk about that a little bit in this podcast specifically. So with all of that, let's get into what I eat in a day. And if you are watching this on YouTube, you'll be able to see this on Chronometer. If you're just listening, then I'll try and read off all of the things I eat in a day for my diet. So the first day that I recorded on my diet was October the 10th, 2022. On this day, I took in 3,791 calories at a high level, and I burned 2,535 calories. Now, that burned, according to chronometer, is based on my basal metabolic rate and how much activity I did. I did two hours of what I consider to be hard surfing, which chronometer says is 628 calories. Clearly, there's a problem here, because if I had a 1,250 calorie surplus every day, I would be gaining weight, according to thermodynamics. This is why I don't think you should focus on calories. My weight is 164 to 164.8 pounds every single day that I measure it. It doesn't vary much at all, guys. So I am not gaining weight. I'm lean. I'm probably less than 10% body fat. But according to chronometer, and if I were counting calories, I would be very undercaloried. I would be affecting my hormones negatively. I focus on food quality. And, and later in this podcast, I'll talk about why I think that I eat so much based on my body type. I'm five, nine and a half, 165 pounds. Most people would say that 3,700 calories is more than I need unless I were doing many more hours of activity than I do. I mean, most days of surfing are kind of intense, but not that crazy. I'm not doing five hours of MMA or hitting pads or two to three hours of jujitsu a day or running marathons now. And I don't do that much weight training on the side, guys, at all. In the morning, I get up. You may have seen my morning routine video on Instagram or on YouTube. I basically get up, I do some light movement, some squats, some overhead shoulder um, rotations, and then I go surf and then I come back and I might do some deep squats for mobility, but basically most days I'll do pull-ups and that's about it. And I'm talking 10 to 20 pull-ups a day. That's all I do because I get so much activity and my muscles stay strong and I stay lean just surfing. I don't want excess muscle mass to get in the way of me surfing. So I don't see a huge point for me right now doing a whole lot of other weightlifting, maybe once or twice a week, I'll do squats, I'll do front squats or overhead squats, but I'm not doing an hour or two of weightlifting every day. And if you can see this on YouTube or you're listening, you'll see that both of these days that I recorded, I didn't do any structured weightlifting, I just surfed. That's all I did. And you can see online what my body composition is like. So what did I eat in a day on October the 10th? I get up at about 5.30 in the morning. I go outside, I put my feet on the ground, I put sun in my eyes, I do some mobility work. I have maybe a coconut that I crack and I drink, and I have maybe a tablespoon or two of honey, and then I go surf. I come back at 9 a.m. or 9.30, and I have a real breakfast. That breakfast starts with kefir. It's raw milk that I fermented into kefir. You can get kefir grains on Amazon. You can use previously fermented kefir to make your own. Here in Costa Rica, it's warm outside, so I ferment this in glass jars and it ferments very quickly. So I add 14 ounces of raw milk kefir to my Vitamix blender. I have the stainless steel part on top, so I'm not blending it in plastic. I'll add some bananas, as you'll see in here in chronometer. I'll add some pineapple. I might add a little bit of honey and I add a pinch of salt. That's my smoothie that I start with when I get back from surfing. Then I have my full breakfast, which is 80-20 ground beef. 95% of the meat that I eat is ground beef. It's just so simple, so easy. I don't really like the steaks in Costa Rica. A lot of the cows here are of a breed that is not terribly tender. When I can get good tender meat, I will eat steaks, but 95% of the time, I'm just eating 80-20 ground beef to which I add butter because I want more fat and I'll add salt. 
I always have organs. In most mornings, I will have heart, which I cook on the grill, and I'll have some fresh liver or some hardened soil supplements. On October the 10th, as you can see here on Chronometer, I had bone marrow and liver from heart and soil supplements. I think it's pretty cool that Chronometer lets you put all of that into the daily diary. So you see here, if you're watching on YouTube, banana, whole milk, that's my kefir, a pineapple, raw, salt, honey, ground beef, calf's liver, butter, beef heart. I had boned broth. They call it boned broth, not bone broth on uh, chronometer. I had coconut water and a papaya, and I had some hardened soil, bone marrow, and liver. And I also had some uh, bone marrow that I cooked uh, on the grill. So in the afternoon, I will maybe have a coconut that I drink for water. I might have another, I might have a papaya um, as a snack. I probably didn't eat this papaya that morning in the morning. I probably ate it as a snack in the afternoon. And I might have a little bit of meat in the afternoon and then I eat it early dinner. And dinner is a lot like breakfast. It's probably 300 grams of 80, 20 ground beef and maybe a raw egg yolk on this day. I grilled a plantain to which I added more butter and some salt, and that was my day. So all of that adds up to 3,791 calories, of which we have 176 grams of protein. I really think that one gram of protein per pound of body weight is your goal. I previously did a podcast on longevity in which I talked about why I don't think restricting protein is a good idea, and I talked about the importance of getting enough protein in your diet. It's critical that you get enough leucine in your diet to activate muscle protein synthesis, and that is what you need both when you are young and when you are growing up and aging. Do not restrict protein in your diet. Aim for around one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Again, there's a whole podcast on the longevity question. Is optimal meat intake going to raise good hormones and make you feel good in the short term but shorten your life? I addressed that question in a previous podcast. I have 285 grams of carbohydrates, though chronometer tells me I have 247 net carbs, if that's something you care about. And I have 230 grams of fat in my diet, and I'll show you how all of those break down. So let's start, before we get into the micronutrients, let's address the protein question a little bit and talk about protein and why I think getting this much animal protein is a good thing. This article, by Don Lehman and his group lays it out very clearly, optimizing adult protein intake during catabolic health conditions. I think that even non-catabolic health conditions, we could optimize uh, human protein intake in this way. He says, although the RDA for protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight, and that's adequate to avoid obvious inadequacies, multiple studies provide evidence that many adults may benefit from protein quantity, quality, and distribution beyond guidelines currently defined by the RDA. Further, the dietary requirement for protein is a surrogate for the constituent amino acids, in particular the nine considered indispensable. This part's really important. Leucine provides an important example of an essential amino acid where the RDA is 42 milligrams per kilogram body weight, and that is significantly less than the 100 to 110 milligrams per kilogram required to optimize metabolic regulation, and skeletal muscle protein synthesis. So if you are swayed by the longevity crowd and you limit the amount of leucine in your diet, you will not have optimal muscle protein synthesis, and that will mean inadequate or suboptimal metabolic health because your muscle is the sink for glucose. It is where your metabolic health is centered. You must get enough protein so 100 to 110 milligrams of leucine per kilogram means I would need seven and a half grams of leucine per day. How much am I getting? Well, chronometer breaks it down for me. I'm getting 12.7 grams of leucine in my diet. So I'm getting a very good amount of actual leucine to activate muscle protein synthesis. One of the cool things about this app is if you're watching on YouTube, you can click over an item and it will show you where that leucine is coming from, specifically I'm getting most of that leucine from ground beef. I'm getting some of it from beef heart and I'm getting some of it from whole milk. And there's a little bit of leucine in um, a raw egg yolk, but most of it is coming from ground beef and beef heart and milk. It's very hard to get 100 to 110 milligrams per kilogram of leucine in your diet if you are not eating animal foods. That's the end of story, guys. So I think it's very clear 
that getting one gram of protein per pound of body weight, and let's just say goal body weight, is essential toward optimal performance and health no matter what age you are, and especially as you age, it's critical. I had a friend ask me the other day, is eating red meat optimal for someone who is 68 years old? To which I replied, yes, perhaps even more optimal, perhaps even more important than for someone who is 30 years old. My friend is 30, his dad is 68. As we age, our skeletal muscle develops a bit of resistance toward the initiation of muscle protein synthesis. The same paper by Don Lehman talks about this, and we need a little more protein or a little more resistance exercise to really do that. So my assertion is this. If you are getting enough protein in your diet, start with one gram of protein per pound of body weight from a collection of things like grass-fed ground beef or organs, mostly it's gonna be from the meat, your muscles will be optimal and you won't have to do a ton of resistance exercise. Doing some will be critical. Surfing is definitely resistance exercise for mostly my upper body, but I will do squats throughout the day when I do those deep squats. I'll do some body weight squats just to practice my pop-ups so I'm getting some activation of the lower body as well. And I will actually go on a balance board and that definitely makes the lower body burn. I, um, I will go skate as well. I probably should include that on some days in my chronometer and skating definitely burns the lower legs. So that's protein. Carbohydrates. I'm getting 280 grams of carbohydrates and I remain very insulin sensitive. Do not believe, and I've done many podcasts on this in the past, that if you are eating fruit or honey that you will become insulin resistant because there's simply zero, no evidence for that there are good studies I've shown in the past, um, done by Rick Johnson, where fruit is kept in the diet to the tune of 400 to 500 calories of carbohydrates from fruit while processed fructose is removed and people do not lose metabolic gains as part of a weight loss intervention. So there is plenty to be said about fruit and honey and how these do not cause insulin resistance. They can be great for you. I recently did a podcast with Faraz Zahabi, and he is a trainer for TriStar Gym in Canada. George St. Pierre, who um, is someone that we've collaborated with at Heart and Soil with the Warrior Supplement, trained with Faraz Zahabi and continues to train with Faraz Zahabi even in retirement. Faraz asked me an interesting question. What about fruit for athletes? And so I went down the rabbit hole a little bit and found some really good literature suggesting that a combination of fructose and glucose, as you would find in something like honey, plus a little bit of salt, is probably the fastest way to replenish your glycogen. So I used to run ultra marathons. I don't do that anymore, not because my knees are bad, I just don't enjoy running for that long anymore. But if I were still doing that, honey plus salt is what I would use during those exertions rather than a goo packet or anything like that. If you're doing long distance hiking and you want energy on the go, honey plus salt, maybe even a little bit of fat because you're moving more slowly would be good as well for that endeavor. You could take honey, and salt and add some tallow or some butter. Trust me, distance hikers will eat anything. But most of us don't need to replenish our glycogen that fast. Trust me, fruit with a combination of glucose and fructose plus a little salt is gonna accomplish that just as fast as anything. You don't have to worry about that. For Ross was concerned thinking he needed to have a pure glucose or dextrose or a polymer of glucose source of carbohydrate refeeding to replenish his glycogen for multiple training sessions throughout the day. And I told him that the literature would suggest that honey with salt will do just fine. So hopefully Faraz is going to try an animal-based diet. He talked about it on the podcast and I believe he will give it a shot. Faraz is eating lots of oatmeal and I cautioned him against all of the phytic acid in that. As you can see, there are many things that I don't eat per day in my diet. I don't have grains, I don't have beans, I don't have cereal, I don't have any seed oils, etc. So those are the carbohydrates that I eat. I'm not insulin resistant. I've shown that multiple times and I get those exclusively from fruit and honey and a little bit from milk perhaps. Gut game changer. Check out this review on gut and digestion from Heart and Soil Supplements. My experience with gut and digestion has been a game changer. I take six pills in the morning before eating and my digestion is so much better all day long. I started with three in the morning and three before dinner to allow my body to adjust and now I just take six in the morning. I've noticed that overall, I feel way less bloated, no more stomach cramping, normal bowel movements, and more energy. If I do eat something that isn't part of the animal-based eating plan, like gluten, the negative side effects aren't as terrible. 
Not a substitute though. They are definitely healing my gut. And I can tell that with animal-based eating only, along with gut and digestion from heart and soil supplements, my gut health has really turned a corner. I love this kind of stuff. We get amazing reviews like this all the time at heart and soil supplements. Gut and digestion has intestines and tripe along with liver and pancreas to help with your digestion. And there are peptides, there are nutrients, there are micronutrients, there are things in the gut of animals that appear to be super beneficial for humans, especially those of us with gut issues. So if you have gut issues, gas, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, pain, check out Gut and Digestion from Heart and Soil Supplements. You can find us at heartandsoil.co, that's .co. All of our supplements are grass-fed, grass-finished, regeneratively raised from New Zealand, cattle only. These are the best cows on earth. All of our products are in glass only. There's no plastic here, and they are encapsulated in gelatin capsules. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal health, heartandsoil.co, gut and digestion, or a number of other desiccated organ supplements there. In terms of fat, you can see here, if you're watching on YouTube, I get 230 grams of fat. Most of that is coming from ground beef. A good portion of that is coming from bone marrow and butter and whole milk. So why do I prefer animal fats? Because I don't fear saturated fats and I want things like stearic acid and 18 carbon saturated fatty acid that I've talked about in the past having benefits for the human organism. There are studies with stearic acid where if you deprive people of stearic acid, there are changes, negative changes to the mitochondria which are reversed and you see the mitochondria turn on and do beta oxidation. They start burning fat when stearic acid is reintroduced in the diet. Where do vegans get stearic acid? You're not getting any stearic acid on a vegan diet unless you're eating cocoa butter. That's the only place on a vegan diet that I'm aware of where there's any significant amount of stearic acid. But animal fat, the fat in 80-20 ground beef, butter, which also has butyric acid, probably beneficial for the gut, and butter and animal fat also have odd chain fatty acids, something I've talked about in the past. Basically, I much prefer animal fats to any other fats in the diet. And people always ask, what about olive oil? Well, I don't eat a salad first and foremost, so I don't have any reason to put olive oil in my salad. Many olive oils are between seven and 21% linoleic acid. I don't want that much linoleic acid in my diet, even in an olive oil. Tallow and butter are two to 3% linoleic acid. It's a very small amount of that 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid that I think is a real problem for humans. I will do a podcast in the near future having Tucker Goodrich and Jeff Knobs back on the podcast to go deep dive into seed oils again, if you guys are curious, but I've done multiple podcasts in the past with Tucker specifically and others talking about the problems with seed oils in the human diet if you want a deep dive there. But you can see here, if you're watching on YouTube, the lipids break down as 80 grams, 80 grams of monounsaturated fat, 96.9 grams of saturated fat. It says I have 10.5 grams of trans fats. Those are conjugated linoleic acid from uh, the animal foods. They're not from chips or anything like that. Those are different types of trans fats than you would find in processed food. And what's interesting is you can see that I have 5.5 grams of omega-6. And what's interesting is you can see I have 5.5 grams of omega-6. That's probably predominantly linoleic acid, but it could be some other omega-6s. And that's from a combination of things. Ground beef does have linoleic acid, but it's a very small amount relative to the total amount of fat in that. If you look at 5.5 grams and you multiply that by nine calories per gram, and you take that as a part of 3,791 calories per day, I'm getting 1.3% of my calories as linoleic acid. And that's, I think, where we should be evolutionarily as humans. Below 2% of the calories as linoleic acid, I think, is critical. Once you go above 3 4% of linoleic acid calories in your diet, I think that's where humans begin to have problems metabolically. And most of the population probably has 5 to 9 or 10% of their calories from linoleic acid. Most people are eating five to seven tablespoons per day of seed oils, which are very rich in linoleic acid. Depending on which seed oil you're eating, you're gonna get more or less of the linoleic acid. Things like grapeseed and soybean oil are particularly rich in linoleic acid and are going to really push that up. I don't want more linoleic acid in my diet. I don't need olive oil in my diet. 
I don't want more linoleic acid in my diet. I don't need olive oil in my diet. I would rather use animal fats. I don't use any fats to cook. I cook on a grill. I've got a Schwenk grill. It's a stainless steel grill with a ceramic element on top. And that's what I used to cook for my meat morning and evening. I don't have a pan. If I were going to use a pan, it would be a stainless steel pan or a cast iron pan that I would put maybe a little bit of tallow or butter in. But most of the meat that I cook has enough fat in it that I don't even need to add oils to the pan. So I don't use extra cooking oils. And if I were, they would be animal fats, tallow, which is rendered beef fat, or butter. So those are the macro breakdown. Let's talk a little bit about the foods I eat, and then we'll get into some of the micronutrients. I prefer to eat beef because I can get it grass-fed and grass-finished. I don't like to eat chicken, but listen, chicken is way better than plant-based meat. And if you can get chicken and you like chicken, then eat chicken. My concern with chicken is that chicken is a monogastric animal, like a pig, and that if you are eating chicken fat from an animal that's eating lots of corn and soy, you're pushing the amount of linoleic acid up in your diet, and that can stall weight loss for some people. So if you are at a healthy weight, if you're at the body composition you want, eat chicken, eat pork, eat bacon. I'm fine with that. Obviously, get the best sources you can. They are animal foods. They're way better than the other options. But if you're not losing weight, understand that getting rid of chicken fat or pork fat in your diet, I believe may help you long-term. This is just what I do, but you can be much more broad in your scope if you want, um, depending what works for you. I also don't have fish in my diet, but fish can be great. Select low mercury fish, salmon, or smaller fish. Don't eat it a ton. Don't make fish the only part of your diet. If you eat a lot of fish, be sure to check your heavy metals. I don't eat fish because of microplastics, because of PFASs, perfluoroalkylated substances that accumulate in fish, probably more than land animals, and because of the heavy metals. But listen, fish is way better, in my opinion, than processed food, and fish is gasp, way better than vegetables, I believe. So if you want to include fish in your diet, that's great. If you eat a ton of it, check your heavy metals. Fats, again, I don't use olive oil. If you want to use a little bit of good quality olive oil, fine, it's better than a seed oil. But I prefer to use animal fats, especially for those of you who are trying to lose weight, trying to become leaner. I suspect, I have concerns that having olive oil in your diet may forestall some of those efforts because of the excess linoleic acid. I will do a separate podcast with Jeff Nobbs and Tucker Goodrich on connections between seed oils, specifically the linoleic acid in seed oils, and the breakdown products of that linoleic acid, specifically HNE, 4-hydroxynonanol, and obesity at a later date. But consider this, there are some really interesting weight loss studies that have been done. And in those studies, we consistently see that lowering the amount of linoleic acid in people's diets results in consistent weight loss. And that I think is the ethos behind eliminating olive oil in people's diets. Obviously start with the seed oils, but I think for those of you who are really trying to lose weight and are stalled, consider even eliminating the olive oil and just focus on something like animal fats. Consider this study, the impact of eight-week linoleic acid intake and soy oil on LPPLA2 in active healthy adults. LPPLA2 is lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2, uh, probably connected with some degree of vascular damage. An increase in plasma linoleic acid following an intake of soy oil was independently associated with LPPLA activity. LPPLA2 activity, which was also related to ApoB oxidized LDL and CEPICT, which is a vascular health indicator. Now, after I just got done telling you guys about olive oil, consider this trial in which they substituted olive oil relative to soy oil and they saw weight loss. So this is what I was saying. Listen, olive oil is better than seed oils, but I think you could do even better in a trial that had a third arm with tallow. That's my hypothesis. But here's a trial showing that fat loss was 80% higher on extra virgin olive oil compared to the control group, which had soybean oil. Presumably, one hypothesis for the mechanism here is that lowering the amount of linoleic acid leads to weight loss. But as you can see here, their conclusion, extra virgin olive oil consumption reduced body fat, improved blood pressure. Our results indicate that extra virgin olive oil should be included into energy restricted programs for obesity treatment. I would love to see tallow and butter in these treatments even more than olive oil. But look, if you're stalling in your weight loss and you have olive oil, you gotta change something. And I think, and I think getting that out there might even lower your amount of 
linoleic acid in the diet and help if you're on a plateau. For people that are weight stable or at a good place, you can eat olive oil. It's not my favorite and I've talked about why. And then finally at a high level, let's talk about carbohydrates. As I mentioned, Faras was eating oatmeal. I'm not a fan of grains, oats, rice. These things contain lectins. They probably trigger a lot of gut issues for people and they don't even know it. Oats specifically contain a lot of phytic acid, which is going to bind minerals in your gut and prevent their absorption. There's a very interesting study I've talked about in the past where oysters, a good source of bioavailable zinc, were administered with corn tortillas and black beans independently. So oysters were given with black beans and then oysters were given with corn tortillas. When oysters are given alone, you see a large increase in the plasma zinc because there's a lot of bioavailable zinc in oysters. When oysters are given with black beans, that amount of plasma zinc goes way down. There's much less zinc absorbed from the oysters because of the black beans. What is it in the black beans? It's phytic acid, it's oxalates, preventing the absorption of minerals. You are depleting yourself of minerals by choosing to make your carbohydrate sources things like beans or grains. Similarly, in that study, corn tortillas completely abolished the absorption of zinc from those oysters. I don't think a lot of people eat oysters with corn tortillas, but you could go to a Mexican restaurant, you could go to a restaurant and eat all of these things together. You could have raw oysters and then you could have tacos somewhere else. And what you would be doing is significantly reducing your absorption of the minerals in the other foods you are eating with those things when you are eating foods like oats, like grains, like corn, right? Wheat, beans, et cetera. This is why I don't think those are good sources of carbohydrates. Beans have all sorts of problems, digestive enzyme inhibitors, lectins I've talked about in the past. Oats are high in phytic acid, I mentioned that. Wheat is full of a lectin called gluten, which causes many gut issues for people. Even rice triggers a lot of gut issues for people. Perhaps white rice is the most benign source of carbohydrates, but I know so many people that even have gut issues on white rice. I did an experiment with white rice myself many years ago and stopped it. I haven't eaten white rice in years. If you're going to eat rice, eat white rice rather than brown rice, because brown rice has lots of arsenic and heavy metals in the hulls. But again, I'm not a huge fan of eating white rice in your diet. I think the vast majority of us are easily going to be able to get enough carbohydrates from fruit and honey. Even if you're a professional athlete, even if you're a high level athlete, a couple of tablespoons of honey is a lot of carbohydrates and that will go to muscle glycogen and you will be fine. It's pretty easy to do. Now, I respect the fact that some people may have GI issues from eating as much fruit as I do. They may want something lower fiber. In that case, consider something like honey as a source of carbohydrates for you if you're doing massive amounts of activity. Most of us can get by on probably 150 or 200 grams of carbs a day. I'm getting 300 grams of carbs a day because the fruit here is delicious and I surf a lot, but I think there's a happy medium in there for a lot of people. I can imagine a situation where a jujitsu athlete might not be able to get enough fruit in their diet or enough fiber, but Faraz thinks he's gonna be able to eat dates, which are super high in calories, so there's lots of options out there. You can play with it. So. That's a breakdown of the calories and the macros and all of the little details there. Before I move on to the micronutrients, I do wanna talk about the fact that my basal metabolic rate is high. There are lots of theories as to why this might be. My thyroid works well. I give myself plenty of nutrients to support the thyroid. I get iodine in my meat. There's iodine in egg yolks. There's usually iodine in raw milk. And I don't do things that will inhibit the absorption of iodine in my body. I don't eat vegetables which are goitrogenic. These are the brassic vegetables like kale or broccoli or Brussels sprouts. I've talked about that many times in the past. So I think that my thyroid works well and you can see that on my blood work which I've shared in the past. Beyond that, I remain lean. I have lots of good muscle mass. All of these create an above average level of a basal metabolic rate which allows me to eat 3,700, 3,800 calories a day and not gain weight with only 700 calories, 600 calories of activity in a day, there's something going on here. I believe that if you focus on good quality foods, your body will become healthy. If you calorie restrict, which is something that I talked about in the longevity versus optimal podcast previously, if you calorie restrict, your thyroid will suffer, your basal metabolic rate will suffer, and you will put yourself into a vicious cycle. I call it calorie restricted prison. It doesn't work long term. You must focus on food quality. And if you do that, you will be more satiated and lose weight easily. There's a great study by Kevin Hall and his group, ultra processed diets cause excess calorie intake and weight gain. 
an inpatient randomized controlled trial of ad libidum food intake. They let these people eat as much as they want. They had 20 people. They divided them into two groups. One group got either an ultra processed diet. The other group got a processed diet. Now they had two weeks on one diet. Then they alternated for the other two weeks. So it was a crossover study. As you can see here, meals were designed to be matched for presented calories, energy density, macronutrients, sugar, sodium, and fiber. And subjects were instructed to eat as much or as little as they desired. Energy intake was greater during the ultra-processed diet with increased consumption of carbohydrates and fat. And they ended up eating more linoleic acid when you look at this. And the ultra-processed diet had more linoleic acid. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see these graphics. The ultra-processed diet group ate consistently more calories per day and gained two pounds in two weeks. The unprocessed diet group consistently ate less calories, meaning they were more full. This was not a controlled feeding study. These were ad lib patients. They could eat as much or as little as they wanted, and they lost weight in two weeks. So this is what I'm talking about. Processed foods will hijack your satiety. I believe that is mostly related to linoleic acid. If you don't eat processed foods, you don't need to go in a calorie restricted calorie counting prison. If you just focus on the quality of your food, you will lose weight naturally, provided assuming that all of your hormones are normal and you don't have other issues going on. But in a normal physiologic state for a human, if you transition from a diet that is 20 or 30% processed foods to 10 or 5 or 0% processed foods, you will lose weight without counting calories, without starving yourself at all. All right, I want to talk about the micronutrients in this diet. People always say, where do you get X, Y, Z on an animal-based diet? Well, Looking at the vitamins and minerals on this diet, they're pretty darn optimal. You can see here, if you're watching, or I'll read them out to those who are listening, there is more than enough of all the vitamins on the chronometer here, except vitamin E, which I believe is due to the fact that chronometer and the USDA database that it's based on doesn't understand that there's vitamin E in animal foods and animal fat. And so it's underestimating this. It would tell me to get vitamin E in things like seed oils and vegetable oils, which I will pass on, wheat germ, sunflower seeds, soybean and canola oil, almond, red pepper, and spinach. Uh, I'm not going to eat any of those foods to get my vitamin E, but as I've shown in the past on this podcast, when I've shown my labs, my vitamin E levels are robust on a meat-based diet, on an animal-based diet. There's something going on here that the USDA database ignores, but vitamin D, I don't get enough from my diet because I get it from the sun but thymine, riboflavin, niacin, pantothenic acid, which is B5, B6, B12, folate, vitamin A, vitamin C, and vitamin K, which they're mostly looking at vitamin K1 on chronometer rather than K2. Those are all over 100% adequacy on this animal-based diet. In terms of minerals, they are all adequate with calcium being 77% because I'm getting 770 milligrams of calcium in the raw dairy. I'll talk about that in a moment. Chronometer would say I could get a little more raw dairy, but a few more ounces of raw milk would put me right at the threshold for getting enough calcium in a day. Or if I really wanted to, I could add a few capsules of bone matrix from heart and soil supplements. That one is a microcrystal and hydroxyapatite. It's a highly bioavailable source of calcium. Copper, iron, magnesium, manganese, people worry about a lot, phosphorus, potassium, Selenium, sodium, and zinc are all over 100% on chronometer. I'm getting plenty of all of those minerals. I want to say a few things specifically about riboflavin before we move on here. I'm getting five milligrams of riboflavin per day in my diet. That is by design. The RDA for riboflavin is significantly lower than that, but I have an MTHFR polymorphism. My methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase enzyme, probably because I have an Italian heritage, has a 677C to T polymorphism, which means that my homocysteine can be a little bit higher than I like it to be. I would prefer that homocysteine to be less than eight or nine if I don't get enough riboflavin in my diet. I'm getting plenty of folate in my diet from these foods. In fact, I'm getting 120% of the RDA for folate. But there's a really interesting nuance about MTHFR, this enzyme that has to do with methylation, that if you get a little more riboflavin, then the RDA, those of us who have this 677C to T polymorphism can have a quote unquote rescue. So this paper is riboflavin lowers homocysteine in individuals homozygous for the MTHFR 677C to T polymorphism. 
Although previously overlooked, they say homocysteine is highly responsive to riboflavin, specifically in individuals with the MTHFR 677C to T genotype that is homozygous at 677. Our findings might explain why the common polymorphism carries an increased risk of coronary heart disease in Europe, but not in North America, where riboflavin fortification has existed for 50 years. Well, riboflavin fortification is probably in things like grains and breads that I don't eat, but I'm making sure to fortify my own diet with riboflavin. Where do you get riboflavin? It's very hard to get riboflavin unless you are eating heart and liver. You can do the research and go down the rabbit hole, guys. There's a good amount of riboflavin in meat. The majority of the riboflavin I'm getting, 1.2 milligrams, is from three ounces of beef heart. Now, I have over a pound and a half of ground beef, and that's only giving me 0.9 milligrams of riboflavin. So beef heart and beef liver are really good sources. In one ounce of liver, I'm getting 0.7 milligrams of riboflavin, and heart and soil, bone marrow, and liver gives me another 0.5 milligrams of riboflavin. That's the majority of it. There's a little bit of riboflavin, they say in coconut water, a little bit of riboflavin in plantain, a little bit of riboflavin in a banana, but but I'm trying to get three milligrams a day of riboflavin. And as you can see, that's gonna be pretty hard in terms of plant sources. You really wanna get these from organ meats. Even Chronometer admits it. Meats, especially organ meats like liver, eggs, milk, and they say mushrooms. I'm not a huge fan of mushrooms. That's a subject for a separate podcast. I had a very bad flare of eczema in residency doing um, some desiccated chaga mushroom, lion's mane, and other mushrooms. And I think these were related. I think that mushrooms caused a pretty big flare for me. So mushrooms are a whole separate podcast. Mushrooms are like plants. They're stuck in the ground. I think they have defense chemicals. I don't think they really add much to a healthy individual. I'm not a fan of mushrooms. But listen, if you're thriving, eat some mushrooms. I don't really think they're killing you. I just don't include them on my diet for reasons I have discussed elsewhere. Again, here's where I'm getting folate from. There's a good amount of folate in papayas. I'm getting folate in plantains. There's folate in bananas. There's a good amount of folate in my liver, my ground beef, and the hardened soil bone marrow. There's a little more folate in the pineapple, but according to Chronometer, most of the folate I'm getting is from a papaya. So that's great. You guys know vitamin A is gonna be found in liver. That's the money maker there. Papayas have a lot of vitamin C. I'm getting tons of that. Let's talk a little bit about vitamin K. So according to Chronometer, hardened soil bone marrow and liver is the biggest source of vitamin K. It must be vitamin K2. Um, I think a lot of times people don't even understand that vitamin K2 exists. There are two forms of vitamin K. K1, which is what we learn about in medical school, phyloquinone, and menaquinones, which is a series of molecules that are all considered to be vitamin K2. When I went on the doctor's TV show, they asked me afterwards, in fact, they accused me afterward and said, you're not getting any vitamin K in your diet. I was eating strict carnivore at the time. And I sort of incredulously looked back at them and said, have you never heard of vitamin K2? Most of these nutritional calculators ignore the fact that vitamin K2 is so critical in the human diet and is very often overlooked. In fact, in the Rotterdam study, which was an epidemiology study, but still quite interesting, intake of vitamin K2 was associated with lower rates of calcification of the aortic valve and with lower rates of coronary artery disease, while vitamin K1 had no association with either of those, it wasn't protective at all. So I don't know how this can be ignored because really the only places you're getting vitamin K2 are in animal foods, meat, and organs. The Rotterdam study is dietary intake of menaquinone is associated with a reduced risk of coronary heart disease. The Rotterdam study, I have it on YouTube if you guys are watching and you wanna read that one. But as I said, you're not gonna get a lot of vitamin K2 unless you're eating animal foods, and perhaps maybe you're eating natto, but that vitamin K2 isn't coming from the soybeans, which have all sorts of other problems in my opinion. It's coming from the bacteria that are fermenting them. Now, if you look at chronometer, it's really confusing because chronometer is telling me the best sources of vitamin K are kale, spinach, and other leafy greens, sweet potatoes, and avocados. That's all vitamin K1. So chronometer doesn't really understand that there is vitamin K1 and K2. This is the problem with many of these applications online. They're based on sort of an antiquated view in the databases. So just for kicks, I put in a another day of eating here on Chronometer, October 21st. This day was 3,563 calories. I also surfed for two hours. You can see that again, I had uh, over a thousand calories of surplus. I should be getting quite fat. As you can see here, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll read it out to you. I eat essentially the same things every day ground beef, 
whole milk, that's the kefir, pineapple, coconut water, honey, mango, butter, salt, papaya, uh, more butter, more salt, beef, plantains, hardened soil, whole package on that day, uh, beef heart, beef liver, and two hours of surfing. Again, the macros are pretty similar. On this day, I had 285 grams of carbs, 219 grams of fat. This says I had 151 grams of protein, so I was maybe a little under protein on this. I think I underestimated the amount of ground beef that I was eating on this day. But regardless, you can see again that the nutrients are all adequate. Chronometer is pointing out that I have too much niacin. I don't worry about that when it's coming from real food. Chronometer is also pointing out that I have too much sodium. I usually end up getting around seven or eight grams of salt per day, which gives me about 4,000 milligrams of sodium. That's just where I feel best. I don't worry about that at all. And chronometer points out, of course, that I'm not getting enough fiber because I'm only getting 19 or 20 grams of fiber and we're all supposed to be um, eating tons and tons of fiber, right? Well, I don't think there's any point in getting more fiber than that, guys. I'm getting plenty of fiber from these fruits that I'm eating. I have one good poop every day. I'm actually not a fan of getting excess fiber in my diet. I think mostly it's I think mostly it's causing us to fart. I don't really fart that much. I have maybe a few farts, like one and a half farts a day. But I know that in the past, if I'm eating more vegetables and more salads, I'm definitely going to have more farts. And I'm not really a big fan of that, even though it's glorified by the vegan community. So I don't think the amount of fiber in my diet is any sort of deficiency. So that's what I eat in a day. Again, I broke it down for you guys. You can go to Carnivore MD if you want to see the calculator for an animal-based diet. That's free. You can find the supplements I mentioned at heartandsoil.co or get your organs fresh, which is always best. And a couple of words as I finish this podcast on seed oils that are very interesting to me. So I think that there's a body of literature that suggests that perhaps my basal metabolic rate is higher because my thyroid just works well. There's evidence that at every level, at least from animal studies and in cell culture, at every level of thyroid production, transport, and binding to the nuclear receptor, polyunsaturated fatty acids, including linoleic acid, can inhibit those things. There's an interesting study in rats looking at essential fatty acid deficiency. They really did not give these animals any linoleic acid and compared it to a 4% linoleic acid amount. And in the animals that had essential fatty acid deficiency, there were some problems, but you're never going to be able to get your linoleic acid to 0.05%. Again, mine is 1.3% of my calories. These animals had a higher metabolic rate than the 4% uh, dietary linoleic acid animal. So the hypothesis there may be that because of the potential for linoleic acid to interrupt the production of T3 from T4, the binding of T3 to thyroglobulin, a transport protein, and the binding of T3 to its nuclear receptor, that perhaps those of us who think our thyroids are doing well and eating lots of seed oils could be creating what might be termed a non-thyroidal illness or a euthyroid sick syndrome in humans. It's just a hypothesis, but I think it's quite interesting. There are interesting papers like this one, evidence for an inhibitor of extrathyroidal conversion of thyroxin, which is T4 to T3 in the sera of patients with non-thyroidal illness. So non-thyroidal illness is like euthyroid six syndrome. It means your thyroid labs look good, but you're not really doing well. And from a thyroid perspective at a high level. So they did find that in the sera, in the blood of these people, there was some inhibitor of this conversion of T4 to T3. And they did specific experiments in vitro and found that linoleic acid did indeed prevent this conversion of T4 to T3, among other fatty acids as well, like linolenic acid and arachidonic acid. So it's possible that this is going on. We don't have enough data here, but I think it's a compelling hypothesis to consider that perhaps if you cut seed oils out of your diet, your thyroid will just work better. You'll have a much higher basal metabolic rate and you'll lose weight easily. So I'll leave you guys with that for this podcast. And hopefully what I've eaten gives you some sort of a framework to construct a diet for you that creates optimal health and all of the goals you're looking for. Again, carnivoremd.com has the free calculator for macros for you based on your lifestyle. And um, coming back next week with more.